At the time, I thought getting shot in the head was going to be the worst thing that ever happened to me. It was 1991. My boyfriend and I were coming home from a volleyball game when a jeep pulled up, a guy with a gun jumped out, and he demanded our money. We were shocked. Now, I was working as an assistant DA at the time, so I was very familiar with robbery in the abstract sense, but I had never expected to be part of one. My boyfriend, on the other hand, was a native New Yorker and knew exactly what to do when getting robbed. He pulled out his wallet. And I tried to follow suit, but when I put my hands in my pockets, all I found was cash. And when I pulled the cash out and the guy saw it, he reached for the cash instead of the wallet, and the wallet dropped to the ground. Well, he must have thought we were trying to pull a fast one because he freaked out, put the gun in my face, and pulled the trigger. All I remember is blackness and something hitting my head really hard. And when I came out of it, I was still standing, but I was really disoriented. And the next thing I remember is seeing the guy jump back in the Jeep. That's when I felt the blood running down my face and realized I'd been shot in the head. Now, I knew I was a DA, so I knew from my work with my crime victims that sometimes when you get shot in the head, that bullet goes inside, but you can't feel it. But sometimes that bullet gets caught between the skull and the scalp and slides around the outside under the skin. So the first thing I did was stick my finger in the wound to see if my skull was intact underneath. It was. I then ran my palms all over my head and face to see if I could find where the bullet was lodged, but I couldn't find a hole or the bullet. What I didn't realize was that by doing that, I had smeared the blood from the wound all over my face. And judging from the expression on the faces of the cops when they got there, I must have looked terrifying. I remember lying in the back of that ambulance on the way to the hospital, thinking to myself, this is going to screw me up for a long, long time. But I was lucky that day. The wound was ugly, but the bullet had somehow bounced off my skull, leaving no internal damage. Now, over the next few days, just about every person I know called me to tell me how worried they were about me and to tell me how thrilled they were I was still alive. It was an amazing outpouring of love and concern. And because of those phone calls, I never had a chance to feel scared or worried or sorry for myself. And because of those phone calls, as strange as it must sound, to this day, I look back on the time I got shot in the head as one of the best experiences in my life a time when everything looked terrible at first, but in the end, I found out how much people cared about me. It's amazing how much easier it is to get through a personal tragedy when people let you know how much they care about you. And I won't deny it, it was a lot of fun to have my picture on the front page of the New York Post, especially with that headline. <laughs> Unfortunately, this would not be my last personal tragedy nor would it be the last time my face would grace the front page of a major city newspaper, because it turned out that the bullet in the mugger's gun that night was not the bullet with my name on it. The bullet with my name on it was methamphetamine. Good afternoon, my name is Will Miller, and I am a gratefully recovered methamphetamine addict, and this is my story. I graduated from Duke Law School in 1988, and my first job out of law school was in the Brooklyn DA's office, where I asked to be assigned to sex crimes, because I heard sex crimes was the fastest way to homicide. But after a few years in sex crimes, I found it really interesting, and I decided to specialize in that area. So three and a half years later, I took a job in the Queens DA's office as supervisor of the Special Victims Bureau. I tried a lot of cases in New York City. And as supervisor, I was also responsible for overseeing crime scene investigations for cases involving serious sexual assaults. Now, most of those assaults happened late at night, and I did not get a lot of sleep during those years. After seven years in New York City, I decided to move to Seattle. It was 1995. My best friends had already moved here, and I, I thought working in Seattle would be a more relaxed experience. So I took a job working for Norm Mailing as a de deputy prosecuting attorney, only to find out that prosecutors in Seattle actually work much harder than they did in New York. But fortunately, I had a strong natural affinity for trial work, and I was considered very good at my job. I love being a victim's advocate, and I love being a trial attorney, and I worked really hard to make sure I rarely lost. In fact, in my entire time in the King County Prosecutor's Office, I only lost one jury trial outright. But success like that at my job often came at the cost of having a personal life. It's very hard to date when you spend all day in court trying cases, then come home at night and spend all night getting ready for court the next day. But finally, in 1997, after nine years of trying cases back to back, I finally got assigned to a less stressful position as district court supervisor. Now my job was training newly hired prosecutors how to try cases, a job that actually finished at the end of the court day. For the first time in my career, 
My life was free, my evenings were free to do with as I pleased. I was 35 at this point. I had been single for a long time. I was tired, overweight, out of shape, and as I started to go out at night to try to meet other men my age, I quickly discovered two things. One, nobody in a gay bar wants to chat up the overly intense sex crimes prosecutor who won't stop talking about his job. <laughs> and two, in 1997, methamphetamine seemed to be everywhere in the Seattle gay bar scene. Now, keep in mind, this is before the internet. It's before cell phones. It's before gay marriage is even on the horizon. It was a time when there were very few openly gay prosecutors. Back then, if you wanted to meet a gay guy, you basically had to go to a gay bar. Now, once I discovered that my job was not going to be the amazing selling point in terms of dating that I thought it was, I stopped telling guys what I did for a living, and I just tried to fit in. And for the most part, that worked. By the end of that summer, I had met someone and fallen in love. And although I barely knew him, I asked him to move in with me immediately. <laughs> Now, I suppose if I had more dating experience, I might not have made that mistake because there were many signs it was a bad decision. One, he was a recovering heroin addict. Two, uh, he had recently be told, been told he had to move out of the place he was living in. And three, he had recently quit his job with no new job on the horizon. But he was really good looking and really charming, and I liked him a lot. And frankly, at that point in my life, that's all it took. I let him move into my home, and a few weeks later, we got domestically partnered so he could be on my county health insurance plan. I really shouldn't have been surprised when a short time later, he seemed to lose interest. We were really very different people. But not wanting that relationship to end, I did many unwise things to try to keep him interested. Now, in recovery, I have learned that this is a fairly common human experience. Apparently, at some point in your lives, many people find themselves in love with someone who does not love them back. And as a result, they do foolish things to keep that person interested. So in answer to the big question that I know is in most of your minds right now, why would anybody in my position do methamphetamine? The only answer I can give you is that I was socially and emotionally inexperienced, I was very lonely, and I thought I was in love with somebody I trusted completely. And when faced with the prospect of losing him, I did things I shouldn't to try to keep him interested. And unfortunately, one of those things was doing meth. I didn't know a lot about meth at the time. Meth was not a common drug where I was from, not back then. And I had also never worked in the narcotics unit of any prosecutor's office. In fact, I was a vocal opponent of the war on drugs and refused to handle drug cases because of it. That left a very dangerous void in my knowledge of narcotics and narcotics prosecutions. Now, to be clear, the fact that I did not try drug cases in no way justifies my trying meth. I only tell you so you'll understand my frame of mind when I did try it. Now, what did I know about meth? I knew it was a stimulant. I thought it had been legal in some form as diet pills back in the 60s, but I knew it wasn't legal anymore, and I knew it was a felony to possess it. And I wish knowing those things had been enough to stop me from trying it for the first time, but it wasn't. It was a moment of weakness of character on my part, and one for which I would pay dearly. This diagram gives you some idea about how meth affects your brain chemistry. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter your brain produces to make you experience pleasure, and these red rectangles represent the dopamine levels in the pleasure centers of your brain. Now, normally, your brain operates with about 100 units of dopamine in the pleasure centers. But when you have sex and orgasm, those dopamine levels double up. That kind of chemical response can affect your judgment. Just think back over your own life. Was there ever a time you made a bad decision to get your dopamine levels to double up through sex? If you're like most of us, you have. When you use cocaine, the dopamine levels in your brain will go up to 350 units and stay there for an hour or two. That's why cocaine's so addictive. But meth delivers the mother load. When you do math, your dopamine levels go up to 1,250 units, and you can stay high for 12 hours or more. That's an insane amount of dopamine. Your brain is not built to handle that. And I am telling you from personal experience that once you've experienced that high a couple of times, ideas like self-control and free will become very abstract concepts. And unfortunately, at the same time your dopamine is spiking, meth is reducing the blood flow to your frontal lobes and crippling that part of your brain that makes good and responsible decisions. It's a devastating combination. It's a perfect storm of addiction. From the first time I tried meth, I loved it. Nothing 
had ever made me feel as good or alive or as sexual or as confident as meth did. And that's because no natural experience can make your brain produce dopamine like that. And at first, the meth seemed to solve all my problems. It brought my relationship back to life. It made me lose weight without effort. It gave me endless amounts of energy. And best of all, it gave me a feeling of absolute confidence. Meth is uniquely capable of giving you an unlimited supply of completely unjustified confidence. But I was confident I could handle it. I was confident I wouldn't get addicted, and I was confident I should continue to use it. By the third time I tried meth, I knew I wasn't going to stop. And soon what had started as a weekend ritual of getting high quickly snowballed into extended periods of use, followed by debilitating periods of withdrawal. Meth withdrawal can leave you feeling impossibly weak, apathetic, and depressed, sometimes for days. You eat and sleep uncontrollably. You sometimes have bouts of paranoia or crying jags for no reason at all. It can really make you feel like you're losing your mind. By December of 1997, just a few months into my using, I couldn't take withdrawal anymore, and I became an addicted, daily subsistence user just to avoid it. Suddenly, for the first time in my career, I started showing up late to work. I couldn't stay organized anymore. I was losing my temper for no reason and being the most incredible prick to some of the defense attorneys. Now, many people believe it's easy to figure out if someone's using meth by their violent or erratic behavior, but that's largely a myth. Individual responses to meth vary widely. And just as some alcoholics can have really high blood alcohol levels but still act sober, the same is true for meth. For me, my meth-influenced behavior wasn't that different from a lot of trial attorneys who are really short-tempered and really stressed out. <laughs> so for the most part, it went unnoticed. Now, being a prosecutor certainly made my addiction much more complicated. I was overwhelmed with feelings of guilt and hypocrisy. I knew I desperately needed help, but I had no idea where a deputy prosecutor could get that help without losing his job. I certainly couldn't tell anybody at work I was committing dr felony drug possession every day. But that problem resolved itself on March 8th of 1998. I woke up to the sound of the phone ringing. It was my secretary calling again to find out why I was late. I dressed in a flash, I grabbed my briefcase, I flew to the courthouse, and when I got there, I put my briefcase on the conveyor belt as it went through the x-ray machine, and then I was asked to open it. It was a common request. I frequently had my briefcase searched on the way into the courthouse. Only this time, inside, we found an Altoids tin full of drugs and paraphernalia. I was in shock. I mean, I recognized the Altoids tin. It belonged to me and my domestic partner, but I had no idea why it was in my briefcase where it would so obviously be found by security. But I also knew it didn't matter how it got there. In a flash, I saw I was about to lose my friends, my job, my reputation. At that moment, I knew my life was over. I mean, I played for time. I said that the drugs belonged to my domestic partner, who's a recovering drug addict, but that was a half-truth at best. I conveniently left out the part about being addicted to meth myself. And a few days later, I resigned my job. Now, part of me was relieved that this had finally happened. As a meth addict, I had no business being a prosecutor anymore, but I did not have the courage or the clarity of mind to resign. And as devastating as it was for me to lose that job, it was absolutely essential that I not work there anymore. I wish I had been able to stop using right then, but as I saw it at that point, I really only had two options. Yes, one, I could stop using meth, face reality, and experience the depression of having ruined my life, combined with the depression of meth withdrawal. Or two, I could keep using a drug that made me insanely happy no matter how bad my life became. It wasn't a close call. One of the worst things I could ever imagine happening to me had just happened to me. I knew if I kept using meth at that point that it would probably eventually kill me, but that was no longer a reason not to use it. That was a reason to use it. My life already felt like it was over. I wanted it to be over. Besides, now I had a different problem. Snorting meth no longer put enough of that drug in my bloodstream to make the magic work. I needed a lot more in me a lot faster. And that's when I started injecting it. At $25 a shot, that was expensive. It only took a few weeks to spend the rest of my money and all of my credit, and for the first time in my life, I started slipping into debt. There was no flood of supportive phone calls this time from family and friends. This was not like getting shot in the head. This was a self-inflicted wound, an ugly, embarrassing mess of a situation that nobody wanted to be part of. 
After my money and credit ran out, I simply couldn't fund our drug habits anymore. And as I came to the realization that my domestic partner was not going to be able to buy meth for me, I quickly lost interest in him. And on top of that, I had started to unfairly blame him for everything that had happened to me. In a meth-fueled rage, in May of 1998, I kicked him out of my house. I will never forget how isolated I felt the day he finally left. If there had been one sane, sober voice around me, anyone to talk me out of that insanity, I would have followed. The timing was perfect. I was alone, I was terrified, and I was completely without access to meth. You would think, think the fact that I couldn't get meth anymore would have been enough to put an end to my addiction, but addictions aren't that easy to kill, especially meth addiction. And there was still one desperate thing I hadn't tried yet to get meth. I was still a very experienced criminal attorney, one who now knew dozens of meth addicts, most of whom desperately needed representation from a lawyer they could trust. In me, they saw somebody who knew what they were going through. So when word went out among the meth-addicted community of Seattle that I was going to return to the practice of criminal law, those meth addicts quickly became my client base, and then they became my friends. They almost never had money, but they almost always had meth. And so my addiction found a way to survive. Now, up until that point, I'd been way too embarrassed to even show my face in the King County Courthouse again. But now, propped up by the chemically induced confidence of meth, I walked back in three months after resigning my job as a prosecutor and restarted my career as a criminal defense attorney. Much to my surprise, I loved it, just as much as I had loved being a prosecutor. It turned out my real love was practicing law, not just practicing in one particular role. It felt great to be able to help my clients. They were my friends. It felt great just to be needed again. And then after a few weeks in the courthouse, I started getting hired by people I didn't even know for money. And I realized for the first time in a long time, I might still have a future I wanted to live through, but only if I could stop using. I wanted to go to rehab, but I faced the same problem faced by a lot of lawyers who want to go to rehab. How am I going to pay for it? Who's going to cover my practice while I'm there? And for me, how am I going to keep my house out of foreclosure while I'm in rehab? So I made a plan. I would try to save up enough money to pay up my mortgage, pay for rehab, and block out enough time to go. It may not have been a very realistic plan, but you know what? It was a huge improvement over my earlier plan of using meth until it killed me. By now it's autumn of 1998, about eight months into my addiction. Somehow, my name still hasn't appeared in any of the news stories about what happened at the courthouse because I still haven't been charged with any crime. Every meth addict in town and every lawyer knew it was me, but regular people didn't, and that's what made it possible for me to still get paying work. But all that ended in November of 1998 when the special prosecutor assigned to handle my case decided not to charge me for the courthouse incident. That decision provoked an angry backlash of editorials and newspaper articles, now complete with my name and photograph, saying that I had received preferential treatment. I do not know why I was not charged. It makes no sense to me why I was not charged. Whatever the reasons were, they were not shared with me. In retrospect, I really wish I had been charged. If I had, my case likely would have gone to drug court, where I would have gotten the kind of life-saving intervention I needed. That would have been the best possible thing that could have happened to me. Because that burst of bad publicity was all it took to kill my legitimate law practice. Within days, all my paying clients evaporated, and any hopes I had of banking some money and going to rehab evaporated with them. Now, even though I was no longer facing drug charges, somehow my life just kept getting worse and worse. I was way behind on my mortgage now, and my phone and utilities were getting turned off, but I still had my non-paying meth-addicted clients so I still had math, so I still felt great. I had no reality check in my life. I needed some kind of intervention, but my family was 3,000 miles away in North Carolina, and they didn't know what to do. And my former friends were all prosecutors who couldn't have any contact with me. And on top of that, almost nobody in the criminal defense bar would even speak to me. I was now constantly and exclusively in the company of other meth addicts, people I genuinely liked who desperately needed me, and whose lives by comparison were really much worse than mine. But being isolated with these people was the worst possible place I could be. In late December of 1998, about a year into my addiction, it all started coming to a head. It was right around that time that my former domestic partner suddenly started calling me and telling me he needed my help in a drug deal. 
He wanted me to help him get meth for a friend of his from Bellingham. <clears throat> he said if I could fund the deal, we could split the profits, and I had nothing to worry about. Now, I realize now that when somebody who doesn't like you keeps calling you to get you involved in a drug deal, it's probably not going to turn out well. <laughs> Those are the kinds of things I might have known if I had been a narcotics prosecutor. But in all fairness to my ex-partner, it didn't take a lot of convincing to get me on board at that point. I had once again given up on my legal career, and I could no longer foresee any future I wanted to live through. And frankly, as a meth addict, this wasn't the first time I had done something like this to support my habit. I bought the drugs. I sold them to his friend. I did it three times. And the fourth time, his friend showed up at my house with a battering ram, a SWAT team, and a Como 4 news team to film my arrest live on the evening news. Turns out the friend was an undercover cop, and my former partner was making a little money and getting a little pay payback, setting me up for the police. Suddenly, I was back on the front page again, but not so fun this time. I know now that my arrest that night was the luckiest thing that ever happened to me. It was the only intervention I was ever going to get. And it started the chain reaction of events that eventually saved my life. I just wish the next part happened a whole lot quicker, and it didn't. And that was my fault. Because I was still a very experienced criminal attorney. I found it easy to get out of jail four days after my arrest. And in fact, the day after I got out, I went home, took a shower, put on a suit, shot up, and walked back into the King County Courthouse to try a case, which I won. Imagine a drug that can instill that kind of insane confidence in you. Now, as for my own case, I used my knowledge of the system to delay my trial for 17 months, and it was during those 17 months that I made my first serious run at rehab. I went to a facility, a very nice facility, east of Seattle, and the, re the recovery model at that particular rehab was exclusively based on the 12-step program. Now, although I'm not officially a member, I'm a huge, huge fan of the 12-step program. Um, for those that don't know, the 12-step program at its core uh, relies on a person's faith in God or a higher power to help them recover from addiction. It's an amazing program. It's full of wisdom and insight, and I have no doubt in my mind that it has helped countless people achieve long-term sobriety. I am, however, a lifelong atheist, so my brain just isn't capable of doing that higher power concept, and as a result, faith just really isn't a tool in my toolbox. And when I brought this up at uh, rehab uh, and started arguing about it, the uh, facility director finally called me in after 10 days, told me I was in the wrong place, and told me I had to leave. So I went back to Seattle, and I stayed meth-free for about three months, and then I relapsed with a vengeance. And it was during that first major relapse that I learned the wisdom of one of the many great sayings taught to me by the 12-step program. You pick up where you left off. Now, what does that mean? That means that when you're dealing with addiction and you stop using your drug of choice for a while, then you relapse. You don't get to go back to the f feelings you had the first few fun times you used. The drug's not going to do that neat little trick for you anymore. Instead, you go right back to the crappy feelings you had just before you quit. Now, with chronic meth use, you eventually reach this point where the drug can no longer make you happy because you've literally worked the dopamine-producing cells in your brain to death. They're gone. The drug still gives you an adrenaline rush, but now the drug starts to make you crazy, either paranoid or delusional or severely ADD. But you know if you stop using it, you'll become incredibly weak and depressed. So at that point, every day that you use, you're choosing between being crazy and being incredibly weak and depressed. That's what happened to me when I relapsed. I didn't go back to the feelings of happiness and confidence I had the first few times I used. I picked up right where I left off. I became really angry, distracted, and convinced everybody was out to get me. By now it's January of 2000, just over two years into my addiction. I still have my law license at this point, but working's really difficult. Concentrating is almost impossible. I had to sell my house that month to pay the lawyer I had finally hired to represent me, and from that point forward I was basically homeless and living on the couches of other drug addicts all over Seattle. My case came to trial seven months later in July of 2000. I was still using meth at the time, but I was also still a total control freak about trying a case. And in a moment of complete desperation, I forced the court to at let me act as co-counsel at my own trial. But as my case began, it became apparent to everyone in the courtroom that for the first time in my life, I was not going to be able to try a case. I was a walking bag of skin with dead eyes stretched tight over a skeleton, 
an emotional wreck who kept falling apart in front of the jury. I wasn't surprised when I got convicted. I fully expected to get convicted. That's when the WSBA finally took away my law license. Even after my conviction, I managed to stay out of prison for two more years, and it was at the beginning of that time period that I finally hit my rock bottom, which is actually a much longer story than I have time to tell today. Suffice it to say that for me, rock bottom meant being homeless, hungry, shoeless, and wet in Seattle during the rainy season. I realized at that cold, wet, hungry moment that prison was going to be a huge step up for me. At least in prison, I'd be fed, given shoes, and dry clothes. But I was determined not to go to prison while I was still addicted. So I made a new plan, a much more realistic plan. I got myself into a state-funded outpatient rehab. I moved into clean and sober housing, and I found part-time work as a housekeeper in a Victorian bed and breakfast on Capitol Hill. The owners of the bed and breakfast were a woman and her elderly mother who had followed my story in the press and felt sorry for me. They agreed not only to be my employers, but also my surrogate family during these early years of my recovery. They were extremely difficult years. I put on 50 pounds overnight. I was often severely depressed. My brain didn't work well, and the cravings for meth were intense. Just basic survival was a huge challenge. As a convicted drug dealer, I was not eligible for food stamps, so I had to live out of food banks when I could find them. And being a convict made it almost impossible to find stable housing. I frequently had to move on very short notice. But at least I had some income and delicious leftovers to eat at my job and the love and support of those two women who owned the B&B. I knew they really wanted to see me succeed. And frankly, if it wasn't for them, I don't think I would have made it. Now at my new rehab, I met with my new rehab counselor and told her what happened at my last rehab. And she was young but wise and got me involved in a recovery program based on a school of psychology known as cognitive behavioral therapy. Now in some ways, uh, it's also called CBT. In some ways, CBT is similar to the 12-step program, but there are some key differences. CBT does not push the idea that people are powerless over their addictions. CBT does not rely on the concept of receiving help from a higher power. And although attendance at CBT sessions is encouraged whenever you need them, continuous lifelong attendance at meetings is not recommended. Now, I'm not here to advocate for any particular program. There are many, far more than when I went through recovery. But, and I even know people that have recovered without going through a formal program. But program or not, the recovery rates are still far too low. Again, I was lucky. I had a lot of outside factors that helped my recovery stick, not the least of which was the fact that 18 months after completing rehab, I finally accepted responsibility for what I had done, and I withdrew my case from the Court of Appeals, and I turned myself into the Department of Corrections to start serving my sentence. My situation in prison was understandably precarious. I was, after all, an openly gay former prosecutor forced to serve my time in the same jurisdiction I had spent years putting violent felons behind bars. Now, much of that time I went unrecognized and I was fine. But there were times I was recognized by men I had prosecuted for serious violent offenses and things got very dangerous very quickly. As a result of that, I spent over two months in solitary confinement in a nine by six foot cell with a bright fluorescent light that could never be turned off. There were days in solitary when I thought I would lose my mind. But despite that, I will always value the time I spent in prison, the vast majority of which was really helpful. In prison, I was safe from temptation during these early years of my recovery. Drugs are available in prison, but they're very expensive and they're very hard to get. And if you're caught doing drugs, you have to do more of your sentence than you would otherwise, which is a pretty strong incentive not to use. I was also never going to be able to afford the two-year inpatient drug rehab I needed, and prison served that role in my life. In prison, I met hundreds of men whose lives had been destroyed by drugs, especially meth. For many, meth had taken their teeth, destroyed their skin, and left them with horrible burns from accidents in meth labs. Some had lost their minds and never recovered completely. Many of them had no intentions of stopping. In prison, I learned this was the insanity I helped foster when I got involved with meth. And this is what I'd become if I went back to using it. It was a life-changing lesson and an amazing gift. And although I will always do everything I can to keep my clients out of prison, I genuinely feel I was somehow lucky to go, but even luckier to have lived through it. 
It was also in prison that I started writing letters to everybody I knew, and that's how I finally reconnected with the family and friends I lost contact with during my addiction. And as a result, for the second time in my life, I experienced an amazing outpouring of love and concern as their letters came flooding back in. Those letters were a vital part of my recovery. They convinced me I wasn't alone in my struggle, and they made me believe that if I could just stay clean, I might just be able to get my life back. And because of those letters, to this day, as strange as it must sound, I look back on the time I spent in prison as another of the best experiences in my life. A time when everything looked terrible at first, but in the end, I found out how much people cared about me. It really is amazing how much easier it is to get through a personal tragedy when people let you know how much they care. Now, the WSBA does not allow disbarred attorneys to work as paralegals in this state, but other states don't have that rule. So when I got out of prison in 2004, I moved my parole from Seattle to Wilmington, North Carolina, where I got a job as an office manager and paralegal at a civil litigation firm. I worked there for eight years. And it was during those eight years that I also got involved with the North Carolina State Bar's Lawyers Assistance Program, or LAP as it's called. The North Carolina LAP trained me to be a LAP volunteer and let me serve as a mentor, a monitor, and a recovery coach for other drug addicted lawyers. LAP also got me speaking at high schools and community groups and CLEs about meth and meth recovery. It was also through LAP that I started going to LAP-sponsored lunches for lawyers in recovery. The lunches were like 12-step meetings, but just for attorneys, and I went very reluctantly at first. But after going for a while, I came to realize why 12-steppers are so passionate about their program. It was at those lunches that I learned just how much shame I was still carrying around with me about things I had done to people while I was using meth. The family and friends I had worried so horribly, the co-workers I embarrassed, the clients I let down, and worst of all, all the meth addictions I had helped enable. Those meetings gave me a safe place to talk about my guilt and remorse, and the lawyers at those meetings taught me how to live with those feelings. Even though I had recovered from meth addiction long before I went to my first lap lawyer lunch, it was the things that happened to me at those meetings that finally made me feel like the rest of me had healed. It turns out you don't really need faith to benefit from a 12-step meeting. All you really need to do is talk and listen. It was also at those lunches that the other lawyers there convinced me to try to get my license back in Washington. Apparently, any lawyer who's disbarred in Washington can apply for reinstatement once they've corrected the character issue or the character defect that led to their disbarment. I knew with four felony convictions it was a long shot, but the lawyers at those lunches told me they had faith I could pull it off. It took me almost a year to get ready for that hearing. I was still a total control freak about anything resembling a trial, and I represented myself. The hearing lasted over seven hours. After a lot of testimony, a lot of argument, and quite a bit of deliberation, a solid majority of the Character and Fitness Board voted to reinstate me. Then, after retaking the bar exam, I was officially reinstated as a lawyer in Washington State in June of 2010. Ten months ago, I moved back to Seattle to start a law practice focused on criminal defense and family law. And the first thing I did when I got here was contact Michael Badger at the Lawyer's Assistance Program and asked him what I could do to help. Now, I really hadn't planned on doing anything this public, but it was the first thing he asked me to do, so I had to say yes. It wasn't easy. I know a lot of meth addicts who have recovered, but I think the stigma of meth makes it very hard for them to identify themselves publicly. But I feel strongly that if recovered meth addicts don't start coming out of the shadows and showing their recovery to the world, the lie that you can't recover from meth addiction will continue to be the greatest obstacle meth addicts faced when trying to quit. The reason my addiction blew up in such a spectacular way had a lot to do with how isolated I became from my sober family and friends, but even more to do with my own false belief that recovery from meth addiction wasn't possible. Recovery from meth is possible and not uncommon. But in my experience, it takes a lot of external support to get that meth addict through those first crucial years of recovery. If you think that you have a problem with addiction, the Washington State Bar Association's Lawyers Assistance Program is ready to provide confidential help. You can meet with the LAP staff personally, or LAP can set you up with a peer counselor, a fellow attorney who can talk to you about your options. Now, best of all, anything you tell a peer counselor is protected by the attorney-client privilege 
That's a little perk we have with our peer counseling program that a lot of professions don't. If you want to contact me personally, I'll be happy to speak with you. I built a really simple web page at willmiller.com with my cell phone number on it. That's one L in Will, two L's in Miller, willmiller.com. Or email me at will at willmiller.com. The most important thing that you should take away from all this is to never forget that recovery is possible and to believe it, because it turns out it really only works if you believe it, which I guess is my way of saying you really do need to have faith, at least in yourself. And if you ever begin to doubt yourself, just remember, if I can survive a gunshot wound to the head, recover from meth addiction, live through prison, and get reinstated to the bar with four felony convictions, you can definitely recover from whatever you're addicted to. <laughs> Believe it. I now turn the microphone over to Dr. Andy Benjamin of the University of Washington School of Law and Department of Psychology, uh, and he'll present you data with addressing the risk factors for addiction and other mental health issues, such as depression and anxiety, that are particularly prevalent among attorneys and often beginning in law school. He will also focus on the means by which an attorney can cope with and succeed, in, and succeed in, in despite of these challenges. Um, first, uh, um, what a complicated puzzle. You just saw Will delineate many pieces of his own personal puzzle. Um, and he did so with grace and openness that, that really is pretty extraordinary. And I, I just want to thank you very much again for doing this. It really is something, and I really appreciate you doing it. Um, what we're going to do in the next 20 minutes is I'm going to talk about the scope of the emotional and behavioral problems among lawyers uh, across this nation. We've got lots of data about that. The drivers that create and exacerbate those problems um, and how you can prevent or heal from emotional behavioral problems, um, and, and more importantly, how you can sustain your health. Um, we want you to sustain your health. There's too much to do to improve the justice in this world, right? So I did uh, first year law school, and we had a third year student who was our small section mentor who committed suicide. What a wonderful man. Just shocking took the whole school by surprise. He was somebody who was so charismatic and um, so available to his peers. He had a small baby and a, and a wife. And it uh, turns out that at the 25th reunion, I found out that the dean of the law school at that time, Henderson, refused to allow him to graduate in his fourth year. He needed to graduate in his third year. He had run out of money wouldn't permit him to go to work, and he didn't see any options. So we didn't know what happened at that time, and, and I needed a dissertation. But more importantly, I couldn't understand the mass hysteria around me as a first-year student and why this young man had committed suicide. It just was inexplicable. So today, please keep in mind what Carl Rogers, with great warmth, once said. The only person who's educated is the one who has learned how to learn and change. How to learn and change. That's the person who's educated. Will's demonstrated a tremendous education, right? Everybody in this room has the same set of abilities, different gifts, same sets of abilities to make some changes. So, we, we are lifelong learners. That's one of our proud um, um, parts of our pr profession, I believe. Um, and I'd like you to kind of consider these slides from your personal standpoint as we go through the slides. Prevalence rates are astounding. One third of the actively practicing bar association at any given time is significantly impaired. One third suffer from depression, alcoholism, or drug addiction. One third. We know that for a fact because uh, when I developed and implemented the lawyer assistance program here in this state, we did a prevalence study. Wanted to figure out what kind of services we needed to provide. 
We did a stratified random sample of 10% of this bar association collected data on more than 1,200 folk. That's 68% return rate. We used validated measures. We made sure that there was a large representative sample, and we, and we had that high response rate. And most importantly, I embedded within those measures a dissimulation index. As I already knew from my earlier dissertation that had been published, that people would not believe the horrendous data that would emerge from practicing lawyers. We don't lie. That's what that dissimulation me measure showed. We don't lie. But we're in a world of hurt and pain. So, since then, we've had 30 years of additional findings from really good, strong methodological studies. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about those findings. We know that before law school, the origins of, of, our, of our problems as a profession has to do with the pedagogy of our law schools. Um, we know that the emotional problems and the behavioral problems, um, that's what I mean by psychopathological symptoms, are driven, are created within those settings. We also know, believe it or not, that this biopsychosocial phenomenon has more to do with the psychosocial elements of, of who we are than our biology. We come to law school healthier than the normal population. Know that for a fact. We have good data to show that. Over three different studies have shown that. It's the pedagogy that drives us. So you might ask, do unhealthy people self-select to join the legal profession? Please say no, resoundingly. No. That's right. You might ask, are the problems due to the, bi the bio part of the biopsychosocial antecedents? You would say no, no actually. Say it again. No. no, actually. Because, you know, nature and nurture, nurture can have a profound impact on our biology. We know that for a fact. So. What are the drivers? What are the drivers? The big ones happen, happen to do with this, this pedagogy that really uh, um, creates a sense of externalization. It drives us away from who we are, our intrinsic sense of self, and instead moves us towards uh, um, uh, uh, the kinds of... Uh, of Extrinsic, extrinsic factors such as status, power, control over others. The demands of law school um, help create this kind of wrong sense of, of where we're at. In this foundational phase of our professional formation, these are the drivers that really push us, in particular, constant comparisons with peers. The loneliness that Will talked about begins there in law school and time famine problems. We know that, uh, um, that, that a third uh, of our law students become afflicted, but so many more of us are set up and become predisposed to, to suffer later during our professional lives. Amitai Etzioni is a sociologist and you know, published this, this quote and, 65, believe it or not. And we know that, it, that, that professional schools exert intense control by purposefully influencing the beliefs, values, and personality characteristics of their students. There was this wonderful researcher, a colleague of mine named Mertz. She went into eight different diverse law schools and, and tracked many different classes uh, in 2006, published these data in 2007. And her conclusion um, in an, an article refer, called The Language of Law School, Learning to Think Like a Lawyer, is she believes that this invasiveness, quote, under, um, see, unmoors the self, marginalizes fairness, justice, morality, emotional life, and caring for others, and exclusively emphasizes competitive processes to the extent that they become the only goal. In fact, we know from additional research that Sheldon Krieger did in Florida, replicated our earlier research in Arizona, and actually had causal 
uh, measures embedded within uh, um, their survey so they could get to the reasons of why um, we were driving so many students to pathology it had to do with negating healthy values such as intimacy and community. My colleagues in the academy, if you think about it, they're the best and the brightest out of the prestige law schools, right? I'm not. I'm from Arizona. But they are. They are. And, and they don't believe that, that, that the pedagogy is a problem. It's what they prospered with. They enjoyed. They reveled within it. As a result, the focus is shifted during the, the law school experience on, on status and money. And we call that externalization. We also habituate our students to the frustration of their fundamental needs. Those needs such as health routines, self-esteem, relatedness, authenticity, and security. We force our young people, many of them, to give it up for the rest of us, setting us up for later problems. So, what are the emotional symptoms to look out for? What are we talking about? Well, there's, there are three symptom arrays that, that in particular um, afflict lawyers. The first one of these arrays has to, has to do with depression, really dysphoria, combination of anxiety, depression, and hostility or frustration. Um, it typically uh, um, afflicts uh, um, about 26% of our lawyers here in, in the great state of Washington. And, and in particular, the symptom that is of most concern is thoughts of killing a self. Lawyers are the fourth profession for suicidal rates. We follow dermatology, I'm sorry, dentists, pharm, uh, pharmacists, and physicians. Maybe the dermatologists within the physician ranks, I don't know. But, uh, but, but we follow those other three professions. Um, what, what's problematic about depression is it really drives the isolation phenomena. And we feel so ashamed about our, our disability that many of us hide. Then those symptoms of addiction, the alcohol and drug dependent array, this afflicts about, uh, um, um, well, you'll find so many of us in, in harmful ways. Um, but the, the symptoms that are particularly damaging for lawyers have to do, again, with that increased social isolation, but drinking or using drugs that creates phenomenal problems with our partners, our life partners, um, and really using those substances to regulate our sleep. You know, because the scope of the problem is horrific, I just want to reassure you that, that you really can take care of yourselves and others. It is really possible. But wait, there's this third array. And it takes us away from being like Atticus Finch. Instead, we engage in Rambo lawyering and lifestyles that Rambo would. The worst of this um, is the, the way we treat others. Treat them with disrespect, anger, hostility, we're cynical. We give up on our relationships. So, to summarize, the, these, these symptoms are created within law school. As you can see from these statistics, you know, the depression, concerns about alcohol use, hostility, anxiety, paranoid ideation, social alienation, isolation, all are increased. Before law school, all these numbers in single digits. After law school, 40% are suffering from significant levels of one or a combination of these symptoms. And it only gets worse for many of us after law school. Um, so depression afflicts lawyers. It's worth 3.6 times more likely than any of the other 104 occupational groups suffer from, de suffer from depression. We know that, that here in the great state of Washington, 19% of us suffer from depression, major depression. And uh, this slide has the base rate differences between females who are from NP stands for the normal population, ATS stands for attorneys, 
These are Washington State data again. As you can see, look at that alcohol problem figure. 71% of the actively practicing female lawyers within the great state of Washington have had significant negative consequences associated with their alcohol use that they would be viewed as alcohol abusive, according to the Michigan Alcohol Screening Test. It's not good for males either. 67% of the males. we got an addiction problem within our profession. Big one. We know that the drug problem is growing because of the prescription opiates that have been prescribed, particularly since the 90s and the 2000s. We got a problem that we don't know the full extent of because nobody will collect data nowadays among lawyers. It's hard. Hard to collect those data. In addition, we have this hostility thing that you wouldn't think really would make much of a difference except for if you develop it in law school and you suffer from significant levels of hostility and cynicism, you're 4.19 times more likely to die of cardiovascular disease in your 40s and 50s. It's a problem. And of course, there are implications for the disciplinary problems. Not surprisingly, the, the symptom arrays lead to lots of discipline complaints and malpractice. Now, if you notice that article down at the very bottom, that Krieger and Sheldon article, that's just hot off the presses. And I would strongly recommend you read that. Um, I, I've inserted the link within this particular slide. Um, it replicates all the findings you just heard about. And it studied more than 6,000 lawyers across four different jurisdictions. It's a very nice study. Um, Sheldon Krieger, the other research group that's done the bulk of the, of the strong methodologically sound studies. So, some of you may be saying, I'm not suffering from any of those symptom arrays, nor have I had any discipline or malpractice action. I'm bulletproof. Ha! Ha! Let's think about a little prevention here. Take a look at these practice signs. Can you honestly say that you're, you're working in an area of law and with people that you want to be practicing with? If so, bless you. Do it. But most of you aren't. Most of your practices are filled with unchallenging work. That's what we know. If you can say that you're making a good living and you're comfortable with your economic return, Bless you. But the truth of the matter is, because of our living in the great United States, we're a little, little diffident about our incomes. And none of us think we ever have made enough money. So we really want you to internalize. We really want you to use your consciousness, your creativity, your, your connections with your community to come back to your fundamental values. That's the good news here. That's what works. That's what creates happy lawyers that have longevity, believe it or not. That's what the data show. So we, we want the intrinsic aspirations such as self-understanding, improvement, helping others, building community to be the drivers. And your values, if you think about them, most of you have values that, that, that are congruent with those aspirations. And there are these extrinsic, extrinsic um, aspirations, such as obtaining high earnings, status, or having great influence over others. Well, you're on slippery ground. It's what the data show. We can move forward. We can move forward. And the way that I'd like you to think about moving forward is by connecting with others who share your values in particular. Um, and developing and restoring the trusting, validating relationships that you have within your lives. Almost all of us have some of those relationships. Many of us have given up on them 
So we're pursuing other things, but all of us have some of these relationships. We want to figure those out. We want to get back to them, and we want to rekindle our lifelong interests that, that will help us build even more meaningful relationships. Consciousness really involves recognition of the harm we've done to ourselves and others. It involves recognizing the harm we've done to ourselves and others. It's called action. It's called action today. I know, I know you're educated. I know that you can learn and really would love to have you change. So hold to your individuality. Really make sure that you're acting congruently with those abiding values of yours that sometimes are lost because time famine, money concerns, status seeking, etc. So can you minimize the excessive stress in your life? I think you can. I think you can, can, can eliminate the habitual overwork. I think you can build collaborative relationships with others. I think you can, you can go about creating justice in this world in ways that are different than what's so typical. We know that you've got to have solid sleep, eating, exercise problems. Got to have strong social support. Got to know what your signal emotions are. And you have to balance, you have to strike balance in all areas of your life. And if you lack any four, any one of those over a couple week period of time, I want you to call LAB. We've got three great clinicians at LAB. Michael, Heidi, and Dan are there to help you. We've got 80 peer counselors, of fabulous people, and they can make a difference. There's this notion of the rule to two. I want you to think about setting boundaries in your practice. You need to be practicing with people you like practicing with, clients and colleagues. You need to make sure that second factor that you're doing the type of legal work you want. And finally, you need to make sure that, that you are engaged in, in remunerative work or elective pro bono. You have to have two of the two out of three of those factors present, or you shouldn't be involved in that case. You need to refer it to a friend who would love that case, right? So that's the rule of two. You want to cut down on unrealistic client expectations by having good engagement letters up front that specify what you're about, who you are, how you work within your value set. You want to make sure that you only take on a risky client at a on any given occasion, one at a time, please, not multiple risky clients, because undoubtedly when you look at your caseloads, you'll decide that you need to purge about half of the cases. Don't violate the rule of two. So these are the key strategies I touched upon today. You can be a great lawyer, and I think work with a sane schedule. I think what what you, you, you can engage in, in self-care in a way that will tune you up and make sure that you can sustain yourself over the long course of your lives. You certainly can write a mission statement about what you want to do this next year to act congruently with your values and what those values are. And you can connect and revel in relatedness with others. Don't be isolated, please. Finally, got to get, a, got to get rid of the time famine issue, right? So make sure that you manage your time. That's, that's what we need. So I am done. It's now time for questions. Um, I'm happy to take questions. Will and I will be answering the questions from the dais here. I wanted to start with a number of comments, more than questions, I guess, that came in from the the people who are viewing online. So Heidi, could you just share a couple of those and we'll take a question from the house. Yeah, we've had, I mean, there's been over a thousand people on the webcast um, and we've had many, many comments uh, just sharing their admiration for your courage, Will, and, and um, how much they've appreciated you sharing your story and um, talking so openly about your 
journey, and, and there's just been an, an innumerable uh, feedback about how much they appreciate that. So I wanted to, we did want to make sure we get that out and, and let you know that. My pleasure. Hi, just a quick question. As someone who is not um, fighting addiction, how can we communicate with someone who is, you know, after they are in the process of recovery, I understand it's going to be a lifelong journey, so how can we, uh, non-addicts, be engaged in the recovery process, you know, through communication and, and whatnot? What's the right way to talk to an addict about their addiction? Uh, um, that's a complicated question. Um, you know, um, I think my mic is turned up too. If, I, I know there's a group called Al-Anon for people that are dealing with um, people that are alcoholics. And I've heard a lot of good feedback from people that have been part of that program. Um, in terms of other addictions, there's probably other similar types of programs. Uh, what specifically are you trying to communicate with? About Let me ask, Ashley. Um, what I would recommend is that you ask the person you're concerned about what level of support that person wants. That person will let you know uh, um, in, you know, how much that person needs. Will's absolutely right on target. We're so diverse, and the way we come at these problems differs greatly across person. And so you need to pay attention to what that person says. For me, um, I really appreciate it when people were not afraid to talk to me about it. it meth is such a taboo subject, that, um, and I come from a really waspy family where nobody talks about their emotions. Um, so there was a lot of hesitation for people to breach the subject. And personally for me, I, I found it very refreshing when people would just go right for it and ask all the tough questions. You know, how could you stick a needle in your arm? How did it make you feel? How did you possibly get over it? It felt good to be able to express those ideas. But I can't speak for everybody in that situation. And you'll find somebody who will say, no, I don't want to talk about that. And I'd like you to call the LAP at that point in time because the LAP will help you through what to do. There will be people like that, though, and it's tragic. We can find those people. This, this is also the exact kind of question that will be probably the subject of a lot of the discussion that I referenced earlier from that 1.30 to 2.30 slot, if people are able to, to stay around for that. So we want to hit as many questions while we have the audience online as possible. So I'm going to go to one more here. So, Will, when you were in the middle of your addiction, what do you think could have helped you better from the Bar Association or from other people around you to help you get out of it sooner than you did? Did everybody hear that question? Um, in the middle of my addiction, what, what would have been the best thing that could have happened to me at that, at that time? Um, what would have helped me the most? <clears throat> it's, hard to, it's hard to look back and say what I would have done for, to, to any particular situation. Um, what I can tell you is in North Carolina, where I was part of the Lawyers Assistance Program, what they would have done that I think might have been helpful. Um, right after the courthouse incident, I would have gotten a knock at the door from two lawyers who would have introduced themselves as being uh, volunteers with the LAP program. And they would have told me anything I told them would go no, f no further. It wouldn't go to the disciplinary council. It was covered by the attorney-client privilege. And then they would tell me their stories of addiction. And they would tell me what they had gone through personally in their lives. Then they would tell me there would be a way for me to go to rehab. They would tell me that there was a uh, foundation uh, with the North Carolina State Bar on a revolving loan program to pay for my rehab and that I would pay it back later. Then they would have gotten me involved in a, a contract with the Bar Association where I agreed to be drug tested and go to a certain number of meetings. And they, in turn, would have advocated for me in both court and in the disciplinary proceeding. Um, I, I don't know if we're set up for that here. Um, I know that if I was very open to that um, when I first became addicted. I wanted help. But being a deputy prosecutor made it almost impossible for me to see a way out. Uh, I think if after the courthouse incident someone had approached me in a confidential manner and offered their help, I think I would have been open to listening. Let's take a question, Heidi, from the online audience. Yeah, um, we've had a, a couple of, of different questions themed on, on some different aspects of what you both have been discussing, but I think um, I'll start with this one. Um, what, I guess, what, if anything, do you think is being done or can be done to change the culture of law school um, in order to address these issues, or is that even a possibility? This is my worst professional failing. I've been in the academy now for almost 30 years, 
uh, made so little progress. Um, I nevertheless am, uh, uh, as my wife of 45 years says, um, somebody who is obstinate uh, and persistent. She also says other things, but that's the most important quality here. Um, and um, I think what we need to do in particular is to make sure that the State Bar Association, uh, um, the, the elected officials of our Bar Association, continue to ask tough questions of our law school. Are our students prepared? Are they getting the kinds of skills, skill-based learning that we know prevents a lot of what the pedagogy drives in the way of psychopathology? If our young people do more skill-based um, courses, if they have more clinic, clinic credits, they do better. We've got data that show that. More questions from the audience here. Uh, Will? Yes, thank you. Do you think, now you made the comment that uh, after your um, disbarment here, uh, you were not allowed to use your legal skills. You went to North Carolina. Uh, would you like to see some of the rules here changed so that people who are struggling to return to the profession can find some ways to use their legal skills so that they've got something to come back to? I think that's a really good point. I mean, my fear, one of my fears was if I didn't work as a paralegal during the time I wasn't a lawyer, when I applied for reinstatement, they would have said, but you're a real estate appraiser now. You don't need to come back to the practice of law. So I really wanted to stay in the legal field. Um, and I totally understand why they make it impossible for disbarred attorneys to work uh, as paralegals, because frequently, first of all, those, those disbarred attorneys are often working as lawyers in those firms behind the scenes, as, as behind the scenes associates, and they're not supposed to be practicing law. Um, but it does really put, them in a very difficult position. If all you've done is law your whole life, and then suddenly you're pulled out of it because of something that happened to you that got you disbarred, you still have to earn a living. And in uh, Washington State, you just can't do that. That's why I had to go back to North Carolina, because in North Carolina, there's a lot of disbarred attorneys working in the legal field uh, as paralegals and, and office managers. So yeah, I would like to see the idea revisited, maybe putting tighter restrictions on what a disbarred attorney can do at a particular law firm. Um, but it's quite a burden uh, for that disbarred attorney to just get by uh, if they can't actually work in a law firm in any capacity. So um, we've had a couple different questions varying on, on the similar theme of what are some suggestions you might have for I guess, reaching out to an attorney that you suspect either that hasn't themselves shared or disclosed, but that you suspect may have either a mental health issue that's impacting their work performance or an addiction, possibly. And you're not sure, but you suspect it, perhaps. And, and what might be your suggestions or your recommendations about how do you initiate a conversation, reach out to this individual, et cetera? So this is where LAP really comes in handy because I got to tell you, Michael, Heidi, you just heard from, and Dan are fabulous clinicians. It can talk you through what, in effect, will be an intervention. Um, they can help you plan how to ask those tough questions. And you can get some support while doing that. They also can probably assign you a peer counselor or two that can go along with you, and that can help. Any other questions from here? What is the current shift in terms of drug abuse for attorneys? When I started practice, there were many attorneys who only passed one bar in their life. And it was very common after, after work to go with the, I was a prosecutor, to go with the defense bar and drink and make deals. That was part of the culture. Can I have the question again? What was, what's the drug of choice now? Yeah, what's, what the changes in drug of choice? Because when I started practice law, See, trees were falling down drunk. Oh. It's still alcohol. It's still alcohol. It really is. 
Um, that's the, the drug of choice for, for our lawyers, no question about it. And, uh, you know, particularly in a state like Washington where more than half of us are sole practicing lawyers, it, it has even a more harmful impact because we do it behind the scenes and we get away with it. Could you explain your rule of two a little bit, please? Yeah, so the three factors in the rule of two. The first factor is it has to be the type of law that you want to practice in, that you find challenging, intellectually stimulating. Second factor is type of, of client you like working with. We all work with certain types of clients very well and other types of clients not so well. And finally, uh, um, we need to make sure that, that it's a, a case that's sufficiently remunerative. We don't have to get rich, but it has to be a, a reasonable amount of money for the work we do, or it has to be an elective pro bono. Um, and you have to have two out of three of those factors. More than 80% of your cases you should have two out of those three factors, and really um, we want to see three out of those three factors involved in, in, in 80 to 85%. So we've had a couple questions also on the topic of uh, the recently passed marijuana laws. And um, the questions are, are mostly, what's your opinion about how this might impact um, some of these problems you've been talking about and um, what your thoughts are on whether this could be a potentially um, additional challenge for attorneys and also is is it really considered a gateway drug you know um, just we've had quite a few questions about how this what your perspectives are on on this issue um, my position is that it's not so much a gateway drug as a gateway crime if you're going to make marijuana illegal you have to buy it from a felon and chances are you like that person. He's probably a normal guy that you have very good feelings about. And now you're associating with a felon on a regular basis. Uh, now, it makes it much easier, I think, from that point to move on to other drugs, which are also felonies. I think making marijuana legal, considering the psychological effects and the, the, the significantly less risk that people face with marijuana than they do with heroin or with methamphetamine, it makes sense to legalize it because I don't want people out there committing felonies and then minimizing them in their mind saying, but it's just not a big deal. I think that that's a far greater problem. And I worry about it from a neuropsychological standpoint. We've got um, pretty good research that shows that, that particularly for young cerebral cortex, um, the impact of marijuana use um, is significant. Um, and. Um, I just want to make sure that, that young people, even young adults, uh, um, um, really don't have access to it um, and that we keep it from those folks. Um, and that's so hard. You know, you know, you know that it's hard. You know it's not going to happen. So uh, we need to really spend that money that we said we're going to spend on good prevention and, and good treatment because we're going to need it. First of all, thanks for both to both of you as the Katsili. My question's for um, Mr. Miller. I think one myth that at least I believe about meth is that once, if you recover your, your dopamine part of your brain, the sensors are kind of fried. Is that just true or not true? How, how's that been for you, recovering just normal ways of experiencing pleasure? Okay. Um, it's, it's, it's true, you, you do serious damage to your dopamine uh, receptors and the dopamine producing cells. And for most people, they will grow back. Um, maybe not to the exact same level they were before you started using meth, but I really think that the problem with meth is that you live sort of haunted by that idea of 1,250 units of dopamine in your brain. Nothing's ever, you can't get back there. Um, even if I were to relapse tomorrow, I couldn't get back there because I've damaged my dopamine producing cells so much. So the real risk for people is the memory of having that bizarre, unnatural high that even if their dopamine levels come back to normal, that's a real memory in your life and that's a big part of recovery is understanding why that's so destructive and how it's not gonna happen again and how it wasn't real 
and always remembering all the bad things that went along with it. Um, some people do fry their brains on meth and never come back. I met many of them in prison. They go crazy and they just never come back. Their cerebral cortexes are like Swiss cheese. They just don't come back. The longer you use it, the greater the risk. The more you use, the greater the risk. Um, all the more reason to get in there early with somebody who's abusing meth and uh, bring them back if you can. We have about two minutes left. So if someone has in the audience a quick question. Um, Or two one-minute questions. The meth addicts I've met have bad teeth. How do you come you have good teeth? <laughs> Diet soda. Diet soda. Um, meth mouth is the perfect storm of tooth decay because you're not thinking about brushing your teeth and you're drinking a lot of sugary drinks and the smallest blood vessels in your body run through your teeth and they constrict on meth and you're grinding your teeth, and you have dry mouth, so the saliva isn't protecting them. And that combined effect uh, will take out your teeth eventually. I had this, you know, when you're on meth, you get obsessed with different things. One, insanely, one of them was flossing for me. Uh, and I only drank diet soda because I was a vain gay man. So that saved most of them. I do have a bridge, a couple crowns, uh, and I'm going to need some work done in the back. But all the ones in the front are mine. They're bleached, but they're mine. So. Okay. No, we're, we're, can I say one thing? You bet. Um, I just want to point out that, that one of the first things that, that happened when the Lawyer Assistance Program was set up is we went and created what you'll find at a, APR um, 19B. And that really does set up a a barrier from discipline or any other lawyer getting access to lap records, okay? So that exists. We also uh, um, created uh, um, protection from liability for all those agents, the peer counselors, or I guess you'll call them peer advisors. So please, if you're interested in becoming a peer advisor, please do. This is a wonderful program. These people do tremendous work. I've seen it for years go on. And the professional staff that we have are, are really fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as any of you who have attended a CLE know, I'm rather ruthless about the start time and the stop time. Um, and we are at the stop time. So I wanted to thank Andy and Will. Uh,